there's always more than one type of unit. Lots of people in the past have done um, calculations and studies and they all want their name on it. They all want to name what they've studied. And so you end up with a lot of different units of what has been named. Uh, but they're all basically the same thing. Every one of these measurements here is measuring the exact same pressure. So whenever we do a standard temperature and pressure, which I'll talk about in a minute, but standard pressure is this one atmosphere and so on and so forth. If I want my unit to end in millimeters of mercury and I give you the first one in atmospheres, then you know how to convert, right, by using dimensional analysis like you've learned before in the class. All right, so these are your standard pressures. All right, so properties of gas again. We're going to look at, like I said, absolute pressure as well. All right, so that here is standard pressure at sea level. Now we're going to talk about absolute pressure. And what we mean by absolute pressure is the pressure you get off of a gauge, all right, uh, is not going to account for atmospheric, eh, atmospheric pressure, right, because it's in a tank, it's coming from a gauge. So if we want to consider what that would be with atmospheric pressure with it, my absolute pressure is going to be atmospheric pressure plus that gauge pressure. Okay, so the gauge pressure is just kind of what you read off of here. This is a little bit less than 15, and I'm pretty sure it's PSI. And then the absolute pressure is going to be whatever the atmospheric pressure is plus that gauge pressure. Okay. Here. All right, so pressure is measured in pounds per square inch. That's usually what you're going to see, PSI, uh, on most of your stuff in engineering because here in America we use mostly PSI. That's what most of our gauges are going to measure in. Your standard atmospheric pressure, again standard atmospheric pressure equals 14.7. That doesn't mean right here in Oklahoma if I took the stand or not standard again, let me get rid of standard. If I take the atmospheric pressure right now it's not necessarily going to be 14.7. That's standard at sea level. And then you always hear about systems coming up, you know, high pressure, low pressures, things like that. So it might be changing a little bit depending on the day. But a lot of times it's easier just to say, let's just go with standard, get that ideal, uh, kind of like the, whenever you're talking about uh, theoretical, what is my theoretical pressure going to be? Sometimes it's easier just to use that standard atmospheric pressure when we're working problems. All right, if a gauge reads 120.0 PSI, what is the absolute pressure? Well, we just take 120 PSI plus 14.7 PSI, if we're using standard, okay, uh, would be 134.7 PSI. All right, so let's also talk about temperatures. And we've already talked a little bit about temperatures in the last, you know, in one of the other units, but absolute temperature. If we look at absolute zero, absolute zero is when all motion has stopped. All right, we have no uh, heat in that system. So absolute zero would be negative 460 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 273 degrees Celsius. Now I know there's some decimals on there, but for our purposes, we're just rounding. All right. It's, which is where a lot of those significant figures come in. Whenever you kind of wonder why we use them, this is why. But so here we've just kind of rounded. But so my absolute temperature is going to be measured in either degrees Rankine or Kelvin. And we have to make sure that we use either degree Rankine or Kelvin when we're working our gas problems because we have to have it on an absolute scale. And if you want to kind of test this and kind of understand why, is if it's not on an absolute scale, we can't really multiply or divide with it. Because if I say 10 degrees Celsius, and I double that, well, that's 20 degrees Celsius. But on an absolute scale, if I say 
10 degrees Celsius, so that's 273 plus 10, 383. And I double that. And then say I subtract that 273 again. I am not going to end up with 20 degrees Celsius. It doesn't multiply and divide the same way. Right? So an absolute scale can multiply into, yes, I have that much more. I have double the amount of average kinetic energy with an absolute. Where if you have a degree Fahrenheit or a degree Celsius, you can't double it and say, I have twice as much heat or average kinetic energy. Okay. Um, so hopefully that kind of makes sense. If not, just remember, always convert it to either Rankine or Kelvin. If you have it in degrees Fahrenheit, change it to Rankine. Use all of them in Rankine. If you have it in degrees Celsius, change it to Kelvin. Now that's to work the problem. Once you've finished working the problem, you need to convert it back to degrees Fahrenheit or degrees Celsius. And the reason why that's important is we talk with degrees Fahrenheit or degrees Celsius. No one's going to say, hey, it's 323 Kelvin outside today. Nobody's going to know what that is. So you always need to convert those temperatures back to degrees Fahrenheit or degrees Celsius, depending on which one it started with. But you, you have to, again, use absolute scale to do the problems. So your standard temperature, sometimes you'll hear standard temperature and pressure, which is STP. So your standard temperature is either 273 Kelvin or 492 degrees Rankine. And if you'll notice, that's basically the freezing point of water. All right, so if the temperature of the air in a system is 65 degrees Fahrenheit, what's the absolute temperature? We're just going to add 460 to get 525 degrees uh, Rankine. So if I said, hey, it's 525 degree Rankine outside today, nobody's really going to know what I'm talking about. So again, after I finish working with it, I would then subtract 460 to get that degrees Fahrenheit again to express my answer. All right, so we're going to start off with Pascal's Law. All right, so pressure exerted by a confined fluid acts undiminished equally in all directions. All right, so pressure is the force per unit area exerted by a fluid against a surface. So this is the equation you're going to use. Pressure equals force over area. That's where we get PSI, pounds per inch squared. All right, if I was in uh, Pascal's, that is a Newton per meter squared. Okay, Pascal, that's what Pascal equals. So Pascal's law example, how much pressure can be produced with a three inch diameter cylinder and 50 pounds of force? Okay, so we write down our knowns. Okay, I'm going to find my area, pi r squared. All right, so it's 7.1, so I'm going to plug that in for my area since I had the diameter. And now I'm going to plug in my pressure is going to equal 50 pounds divided by 7.1 inches squared. Okay, and knowing that, you know, in Pascal's, it's Newton per meter squared, more than likely Pascal's law was more with the metric system but because we're engineering we're in uni the United States that's why we'd use PSI instead okay so the final 7.0 pounds per inch squared so it says the perfect gas laws we're going to talk about Boyle's law Charles law Gay-Lussac's law and then we're going to talk a little bit about the fact that you can combine those all into one if you have everything changing instead of one thing staying constant Okay, so here's Boyle's Law. When we increase the pressure, right here, we increase the pressure, my volume's going to go down. All right, so the volume of gas at a constant temperature, notice this is assuming that we have a constant temperature, is going to vary inversely with the pressure. Okay, so this is what the equation looks like. P1 times V1 
equals P2 times V2. In this example, we're looking at uh, volumes in inches cubed. Now, volumes can be liter, milliliter. It can be meters cubed, inches cubed, centimeters cubed, so on and so forth. Uh, it's always going to be, though, a volume is always going to uh, kind of be the same units. When you're looking in one of those problems, you're trying to solve an equation, and you see something cubed, you know it's volume. Or if you see it as liter, milliliter, quart, it's a volume. If you see something in grams or slug, it's going to be a mass. Um, you know, that's that's how you kind of wonder. Whenever you're reading through and you're just kind of trying to pick numbers out, you know what they are based on what unit they are. All right, so here's an example. A cylinder is filled with 40 inches cubed. Again, that's a volume, right, because it's inches cubed of air at a pressure of 60 PSI. PSI, I know that's a unit for pressure. The cylinder is compressed to 10 inches cubed. All right, my units are matching. That's great. What is the resulting absolute pressure? All right, so we look at the fact that uh, this is in PSI, so my answer is going to be in PSI. Okay, so here is uh, my knowns. Okay, I've got to convert first that 60 pounds per inch squared, or PSI. I need to convert it into absolute pressure because it does ask for the resulting absolute pressure. Now, if it told me this was absolute pressure and it wanted it in absolute pressure, I wouldn't have to go through this step first. But notice that I've got two different types of pressure and I have absolute pressure. So that's why I've got to do that. So here's my formula, and I'm going to plug it in, solve for it, okay? And they're putting it into correct number of significant figures because I have two in each of these due to that decimal after it, making those zeros significant. Okay, so Charles' Law. Now, as you can tell here in the picture, we're increasing the temperature. We add a fire to it, we increase the temperature, and because I'm increasing the temperature, my volume is going to increase. Notice I'm not doing anything with pressure. Pressure is staying the same. So as it says here, volume of gas increases or decreases as the temperature increases or decreases. So it is directly proportionate. Okay. So here is the equation. Volume 1 over temperature 1 equals volume 2 over temperature 2. And notice too, these temperatures have to be in the absolute temperature, either degree Rankine or Kelvin. All right, so an expandable container is filled with 28 inches cubed of air. Notice that's a volume. And is sitting in ice water that is 32 degrees Fahrenheit. The container is removed from the ice water and is heated to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. What's the resulting volume? All right, so let's put in all of our knowns. Notice we're going to have to convert those to Rankine by adding 460. All right, so now we're ready to plug it into our formula. And the best way to do this is to cross multiply. My unknown is this one here, V2. So I'm going to say 28 times 660. And then I'm going to divide it by 492. So you multiply the ones together here, crossing across here, cross multiplying like an X. And then you divide by the ones that have the unknown. So that's why I'm dividing by 492. My first unit here is inches cubed. So my resulting answer is going to be also in inches cubed. Gay-Lussac law. Absolute pressure of a gas increases or decreases as the temperature increases or decreases. Provided the amount of gas and the volume are going to remain constant. So I'm not changing the amount of gas that I have in there. And I'm not changing the volume. It's maybe um, a cylinder, right? You've seen the cylinders like welding companies have with oxygen or whatever in it, helium. Uh, those aren't going to change. And so when those get heated up, the pressure inside is going to also um, increase. All right. 
So these are directly proportionate again. Nose temperature again is in absolute. And your pressures also would be in absolute. Okay, so pressure one over temperature one equals pressure two over temperature two. And so here's an example, a 300 inch cubed <clears throat> sealed air tank is sitting outside. Notice it says sealed air tank, so that means my volume's not gonna change. In the morning, the temperature inside the tank is 62 degrees Fahrenheit, and the pressure gauge reads 120 PSIs. Notice the pressure gauge, so that means we're gonna have to change that to, um, we're gonna have to change that to an absolute, right? By afternoon, the temperature inside the tank is expected to be close to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. What will the absolute pressure be at that point? Okay, so here's my knowns. This pressure 1, I'm going to have to convert by adding 14.7. Again, we're assuming a standard pressure, not actually taking the atmospheric pressure at that exact time. All right, so convert P to absolute pressure. 134.7 PSIs. We've got to convert our uh, Fahrenheit to degree Rankine by adding 460. I'm going to plug those in. And so then my pressure is going to be now in that uh, absolute pressure because the other one was. So it's 140 PSI. All right. If the absolute pressure is 141.9 pounds per inch squared, what is the pressure reading at the gauge? Well, again, uh, if you need to go from uh, absolute pressure and then you want to find out what the gauge is, then you would subtract 14.7 PSI. Okay. Significant figures is why they changed it to 130.